as we move into the sermon today and uh, and of course the opportunity to participate in the communion uh, i'm sure all of us like new things don't we we all uh, enjoy for example new clothes whenever we purchase new clothes we are eager to you know wear it and probably show it off and i know that children especially love new toys uh, just uh, the last month our grandson um, celebrated his first birthday and my son and uh, his wife purchased an elephant for him an elephant on which he could ride <laughs> and they showed us how he was removing the tearing off the you know uh, the paper in which it was wrapped it was so nice to see that but there is such an excitement when we have something new we can look forward to and talking about new i am looking forward to a new laptop because <laughs> my laptop is slowly beginning to you know uh, show its age and like we were reminded about the new year uh, by selina in her children's sermon uh, we are all we were all waiting for this new year we were longing for the old year to go by and we are hoping that it would provide all of us a new beginning and as we talk about new you know the new things as we talk about newness how about a new birth right uh, i'm sure that some of us would want uh, a second birth Uh, a, a, another chance to live and do what is right and uh, you know try our best not to repeat mistakes that we have made in the past and better still what about a new creation what about a new earth even as the earth goes through our earth goes through so much of stress and strain and talking about uh, a new earth you know the scientific community and the scientific enterprise is trying to give us so many things new if you see the kind of technologies that are coming along today you hear about nuclear technology and you hear about digital technology uh and now new new names are coming nanotechnology robotic technology space technology and information technology and uh, i think it is wonderful to see the tremendous amount of scientific uh, progress that have been made and we must thank our scientific community for the tremendous amount of innovation and progress that technology makes but sadly unfortunately even though we have all of this new technology coming our world is not necessarily a better one every year we seem to be facing new challenges like for example the new virus and the new virus becoming you know uh, mutating to other viruses uh sometimes we have we we see more degradation in spite of new technology that may have been uh you know developed and even worse still if you look at humanity as a whole hu- human kind is not necessarily becoming better we are not experiencing newness in our nature as a human being it's so sad when we see people becoming more selfish more greedy unfortunately more destructive emotionally disturbed spiritually unfulfilled you know relationally isolated uh all of these things continue to plague us as human beings and though we see so many new things taking place but human the human nature is not progressing towards you know a newness which is better than what is in the past but we have some good news interestingly enough the bible talks of a new creation and a new birth uh in fact it talks about a fairy tale ending you probably all the children will know uh the fairy tale ending of every good story and they lived happily ever after 
Interestingly enough, that is what the Bible talks about. And when I talk about a story ending with they lived heavily, uh, uh, lived happily ever after, it reminds me of my son. You know, every time I used to tell him the story when he was a little boy, I came to this line and say, and they lived happily ever after, then he would say, and then what happened? You know, he wanted to know what happens after, happily ever after. I said, they lived happily ever after. But he said, and then what? <laughs> he didn't want the story to end, you see. But today, I want to talk about, you know, this newness. Even as we are moving into a new year, we've already entered into it. Hasn't been too encouraging as we see turmoil all over the world. Uh, and I want to title my uh, sermon. And let me just go ahead and share my screen. Give me just a moment to do that. Okay. Uh, let me go back to the title here. There you are. The title is Immersion and New Creation. You must be wondering, what is this title? Immersion and New Creation. Uh, the, re the, the reason I have titled it that way is this new creation, this newness is going to come about because of immersion. <laughs> and you must be wondering, now, what is this immersion? Am I talking about a new theology here? Maybe we can call it immersion theology. <laughs> uh, obviously, there is nothing like an immersion theology. Uh, I just made up that that uh, that word, but uh, but I think it, it it fits in very well. So we are going to talk about a new creation and how it comes about by this immersion. But let's talk about the new creation. You know where we are told in the book of Revelation, read to us by Sikinda how we can look forward to, uh, you know, such wonderful new things, everything being made new. Look, look at the fifth verse in what was read to us from Revelation 21. It says, he who was seated on the throat sa throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. So, uh, here is a promise and children, <laughs> you just heard about promises, how God is going to keep his promises. And here is a promise that we can look forward to. He is going to make everything new, right? And, uh, and uh, the verse goes on to say, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. In other words, God is saying that there is an absolute guarantee that this will happen. This will take place. You, whenever you buy things, it comes with a warranty, right? Well, here is an eternal warranty that God is giving us that he is going to make everything new. And uh, what, what are the new things we can look forward to? Well, let's read in verse one. It says, then I saw uh, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. In other words, the promise is for a brand new universe, a brand new cosmos, right? Uh, a new earth where there will be no pollution, no more global warming and uh, no more storms and cyclones and typhoons and earthquakes. Interestingly enough, it also says, well, we're going to have a new heavens and a new earth. And uh, there is no longer any sea. Now, this is obviously symbolic language. You all know that Revelation is very heavily written in uh, symbolic language. And the, the, the symbolism of the fact that there is no sea could be that the sea is representative of evil, right? Uh, evil that ferments trouble and maybe this is indicative of that God is going to make everything so new that the very source of evil will be completely removed and so uh, he promises that there will be no longer any sea what else does he promise verse 2 it says 
I saw the holy city, the new, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for a husband. The holy city, the new Jerusalem. Now, once again, uh, there could be a symbolic meaning behind it. Uh, could it be a literal uh, city? Probably. But they can also recognize maybe this is talking about the redeemed humanity, a new humanity, right? Or perhaps you could more specifically say that the church that is cleansed and dressed in garments of righteousness. And so we are promised that we are all going to have new glorified bodies, no more having a sinful nature and no more wanting uh, having the urge to sin and spoil things. Uh, and so isn't this wonderful that we can look forward to all of these uh, new things as we move along? What else is going to be new? Let us just rehearse two more verses from Revelation 21. In verse 3 it says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. God is promising in this new world that his presence will finally be seen, will be felt, will be heard. It's a complete contrast from what we experience today. Today, we are unable to, you know, experience God in such a way where we can literally see, hear, feel him, right? Uh, now, even though God is with us, I am not saying God is not with us. God is with us. But for some reason, we still feel a sense of distance, right? But that is going to be removed. And uh, we will have, like the apostle says, almost like a face-to-face -face relationship with God. We don't have to wonder in this new world, where is God or why is he not, you know, uh, present with me in my troubles? All doubts of God being distant will finally be gone. And one more thought from verse four in this chapter, he says, and this is one of my favorite verses in the scriptures. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. In this pristine world, where we can experience God in such an intimate, close manner, all the tears are wiped away. No more suffering, in other words, the suffering like we see today, because the old has gone. The old order of things now has passed away and never ever to return, the new indeed has come. So another question is, you know, how is this going to happen? And the good news is that it is already happening. It's already in progress. Jesus has already put it into progress. And that is where I like to talk about, you know, my terminology, immersion theology. And for this, I must refer back to a scripture that I had read to you all uh, on New Year's Day, let me bring that up again. If you remember in the second book of Corinthians chapter five, we are, we are told in verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God uh, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus, uh, through Christ and give us the ministry of reconciliation. So this, this uh, being in Christ, I call immersion theology. Uh, this new creation we are told will take place in Christ. He is the author of it. He is the one who is actually accomplishing it. In Christ, we are told the old will be replaced by the new. Christ is the creator of the universe. He is the one who said, let there be light, you know, who created the heavens and the earth. Now he is recreating and giving rise to a new creation. How is this possible? Once again, I refer you back to that very powerful, uh, you know, uh, phrase in Christ. It is all possible in Christ. Right. 
through a series of immersion, you know, uh, Christ has recreated the cosmos. He's accomplished a brand new creation. And so the question is, what is this immersion that I keep talking about? How did Christ, you know, bring about this through this immersion? Uh, and for that, let's look at the first immersion. All right. And the picture will probably give you uh, and tell you what I mean by that immersion that Jesus Christ, uh, you know, participated in. All of you will, re will remember reading John 1 and verse 14. What does it say? And we just celebrated, you know, the, the Christmas season. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Maybe I'll put it this way. What did Jesus do? He immersed himself in our world, in our human condition, in our flesh. There is that first immersion, right? He was not born as an adult, remember. He, he, was, he became an embryo in Mary's womb. He was, he was, it indicates that his participation and immersion into the human condition was 100%, right? So he immerses himself in the fleshly existence that we all experience. Apostle Paul, writing to the Philippians, puts it this way. He says in Philippians chapter 2, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. What, what uh, this verse is telling us is that Jesus did not change his nature from being God, but he, in addition, took on the nature of a servant. And that is what it means by saying he made himself nothing. He did not give up being God. He retained or rather he took on the human nature and, uh, you know, he became like for us like a servant. He was not born in a palace but he was born just as an ordinary person right here on the earth. He, once again, if I can use that word, he immersed himself in human likeness. He was every bit a human. That's the first immersion. Now, I'm sure as we move along, you will very, very quickly begin to guess what is the second immersion, right? And uh, the picture will show you what that second immersion is. Let's read it in Mark chapter one. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in, in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. Notice those words, very interesting, torn open. And the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Obviously, this is talking about Jesus' baptism. Why would Jesus be baptized? And we had discussed that in our Bible studies, uh, you know, uh, uh, last year. But uh, for those of you who uh, haven't heard, you know, for what, why was Jesus baptized? He had no sin. He did not have any sin to confess or repent of. But here is the interesting uh, truth that we can learn. Jesus' baptism was an immersion, an immersion into our sinful condition. He had no sin, but he was immersing himself into our sinful condition. He, you could say, immersed ourselves into our sin, not by committing sin, but by entering the sinful condition of the flesh through the symbolism of baptism. So in one sense, he was like, you know, pardon me if uh, this is a bit of a graphic uh, example. You, all of us here in India know about scavengers, the work of scavengers, right? What do they do? They enter into the sewer system, into the drainage deep into the earth and remove the mess of others. Uh, I hope I'm not grossing you out, but Jesus was so humble that he would be willing 
to be like that scavenger who goes into the very drains of our lives and cleanses us through his precious blood. That's the emotion that we see Jesus doing through his baptism. In one sense, he was being baptized for us. His baptism is actually applicable to us because he was cleansing us, you know, through his divinity. Now, something very interesting in that verse in Mark 1 we just read. Notice it says in verse 10, as Jesus was coming out, up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. And the phraseology there is very graphic, torn open, and the spirit descending him on him like a dove. In other words, his action of baptism was breaking down the barriers. You could say tearing the barriers between humanity and God. His divinity in our humanity was making something new. There you are. We are looking at something new being created. A new humanity was being born in Jesus, right? He was cleansing human, the humankind so that we could be reconciled and, like it says, become well-pleasing like Jesus to the Father in heaven. Just as the Father acknowledges his Son and he's so well-pleased in his Son whom he loves, he can say that to us as his children, that he is going to be pleased with us because of what Jesus did for us. And then as we look at that second immersion, let's move to the third immersion. What is the third immersion? The picture perhaps will, you know, tell it all. But let's read it also. In Matthew 27, it tells us, they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Notice the third immersion. What was Jesus doing? He was immersing himself into human pain, human misery, and human death. His immersion was so complete that he goes all the way, even into human death. You know, Many of you have asked me the question, why did Jesus have to die? And that's a question I've been reflecting on. And one of these days, I'm going to do a Bible study on that. But I'm beginning to begin to see why was the what was the necessity for Jesus to die? And I believe this answers it. He was immersing himself into our death, right? John 19 tells us uh, in verse 30, uh, he, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In other words, uh, the immersion was so complete that Jesus now declared, it is finished. It is done. Jesus submersion into human sinfulness and depravity and human pain and death is now complete. It was it was done when Jesus finally, you know, died as a human upon the cross. And then, of course, I must bring this, this image into our minds as we talk about the third immersion. This is found in Matthew 27. Notice it says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn. Remember, we talked about the, the torn heavens. Now notice there is a torn curtain. Uh, temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs were broken open. Uh, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Right? The torn curtain in the temple, once again, is uh, a reflection of the torn heaven. You know, the heavens being torn. And what does it symbolize? The barrier between the holy of holies, as far as the temple is concerned, and the rest of the people now has been completely been removed, banished, taken out, right? And when that took place, what happened? The tombs broke open. 
and people started coming to life. In other words, death was conquered. Jesus' immersion through the three immersions was so complete that now he is bringing something new into the world. The old life is gone through the death. And now a new life has come. A new birth was taking place. You could say the kingdom of God was breaking upon humanity in power. So now that the immersion was complete, right? We looked at the three immersions. There's something very interesting I'd like to leave you with. I'd like to put it this way. The reversion, the, the immersion is reversed. What happened after the crucifixion and Jesus' death? The third day, obviously the resurrection took place, right? We are told in Matthew 28, it says, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, right? Death, that was the third immersion. Verse six, he is not here. He has risen just as he said. The body is gone. He has risen. The body has been transformed like we know as we read on. His, he was resurrected, but his resurrection was bodily. He had a bodily resurrection. That's why the disciples could see him. But he had a glorified body, right? It was no more a fleshly body like ours. But now the body has been renewed. It is uh, gone into a new birth, into a glorified body. And what did that body contain? This is where the immersion is reversed. In that glorified body, all of humanity is represented. In other words, we now are immersed into the glorified body of Jesus. Isn't that wonderful to know, right? Immersion reversed. We are now immersed in him, just as he immersed himself in us. And because we have the opportunity to accept that inclusion in Jesus' glorified body, we will be secure in him. And what happens 40 days later? I'm sure you all know, 40 days later comes the ascension, as we are told in Acts chapter 1. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hidden from their sight. In his glorified body, he included humanity and he was now taking humanity to the Father in heaven. He was presenting a new born humanity to the Father in heaven for acceptance. And in Jesus, we are all accepted, all of humanity, no matter where you come from, what color of skin you have, what uh, you know, tradition you're born in. Jesus has done something for all of us that you know, gives us a sense of security. So brethren, because of these three immersions, we have become new. We have a new birth. This is the newness we can, we can be absolutely assured of because that's the promise of God, which will never fail, which will be accomplished in its own time. And nobody can stop that process because the three immersions have already taken place and the reversed immersion has already taken place. That's why the apostle says it is as though we are seated in the heavenlies because of Jesus. He is a present in humanity in the heavens. So nothing can stop that. The gates of hell will never prevail against it. No matter how many difficulties we face as a Christian, as a church, as a believer, we are our, uh, you know, victory is assured. And, uh, so how shall we live our lives then? I go back to that verse in the book of Corinthians, which I brought to you earlier. Therefore, you know, with confidence, we can say, if anyone is in Christ, the immersion, the reversed immersion, he is a new creation. You're already born anew. You have been born again. And when were you born again? When Jesus rose from the grave. That's when you were, all of humanity was born again, right? He is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. We are in Christ because Christ came into us first. We are immersed in Christ because Christ immersed himself in us. 
And we are now given the opportunity to accept that immersion in him. And that is why many of us get baptized as a symbol to show, yes, Lord, just as you immersed yourself in me, I immerse myself in you. There is another symbol that talks about or that represents this immersion. And what's it called? It's called communion, right? This immersion is called communion. So let me stop sharing and let me lead you in this communion. Uh, communion, brethren, is an acceptance of Christ's immersion in us. And our acceptance as we participate, our acceptance of we being immersed in Jesus, even as we take Jesus in us, he is including us in him. That is why we are told we are in Christ. So let's celebrate. Even as a new year dawns. Even as the old has gone. And the new has come. And the new will now progress to its final conclusion. Ultimate conclusion in the fullness of the kingdom. Right? And so in that assurance... Let us pray over the elements. You may have your elements ready if it is uh, before you. Join me as I ask for a blessing upon the bread and the wine. Gracious, loving Father, as we come, to, come into your presence, we know, Lord, you have included us because you immersed yourself in our condition, in our flesh, in our existence. And you lived a life to finally vanquish us with the victory uh, over pain and misery, suffering and death. Thank you, Lord. That process now is put into gear. It will never stop. The gates of hell will never prevail against it. And so I pray, Lord, that you will bless this bread as a symbol of your body that you allowed to be immersed in us. And as we participate, help us to immerse ourselves in you. We pray for this wine, which is a symbol of your blood cleansing us completely. And we thank you for that sacrifice that indeed has given us opportunity to be included in you. We ask your blessings upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. The bread, brethren, the body of Jesus Christ, let us immerse ourselves into the glorified body of Christ. And the wine, the blood of Christ that was washed us, that has washed us and given us new birth. And now, as we have opportunity, whenever we have it, let us live and share this wonderful gospel, this good news that Jesus has immersed us in him. We look forward to the fullness of it. God bless you.